Shall we pray? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At the moment, there's a lot of waiting going on, isn't there? Um, waiting for the end of lockdown, waiting to have a vaccination, Mothering Sunday, mothers waiting to hug their children, children waiting to hug their mothers, some of us waiting for anyone to hug. Um, but some of us waiting for a haircut, uh, some of us waiting to get back to work. There's loads of things uh, that we're waiting for. Uh, Habakkuk was also waiting, you may have noticed that in the reading we've just had, and um, just as uh, he was waiting for God to do something, so we're waiting for God, aren't we? We've had this long-term wait for the return of the Lord uh, to our world to come and change things uh, forever. And so the Lord gives Habakkuk two pieces of advice uh, in verses 2 to 5, and I want to focus on those uh, for a few minutes. Uh, and the first piece of advice that Habakkuk is given in his waiting is wait and keep listening to the revelation. Now, the word revelation uh, appears twice here in these verses. Uh, so verse 2, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. A, a revelation, of course, is something that is hidden uh, but is then revealed. So most of us have a revelation every day, don't we? We walk up to the curtains, we pull them back. It's a revelation. Uh, we go to the mirror, haven't seen ourselves for eight hours. And that's a revelation, not a very pleasant one sometimes. And this is what we believe the Bible is. The Bible is a revelation. Uh, it's God uh, revealing himself in the world. If God hadn't revealed himself, how would we possibly know what he's like? Uh, and we'd have no idea where the world is going. Well, Habakkuk is told here in verse 2 to write down the revelation. Jolly glad he did write it because we wouldn't have it here this morning uh, if he hadn't done that. Habakkuk also is told in verse 2 to make it plain so that anybody can read it. I think sometimes we forget this. The Bible is God's revelation for the world. It's not just for us. This is a, a revelation for Burford, for all the people of Burford the biggest thing they need. And so Habakkuk is told in verse 2 to put it on tablets. Uh, tablets in the 7th century BC were uh, used to display for the public to read so other people could read it. That's part of our job, being the church here, to get the revelation out. Habakkuk is told in verse 2 that it should be passed on via a herald. But this revelation here is of a particular type. Look at uh, verse 3. The revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Now, in the Bible, we would call this a prophecy. Uh, this is not God forecasting, forecasting the future. Uh, forecasters get it wrong, don't they? We hear that most days, where forecasters haven't quite got it right. No, this is God telling us what's going to happen in the future. And all through the Bible, we have lots of prophecies that have been made and have ultimately come true. I mean, in the very first book, there's a prophecy. Uh, the first prophecy I know in the Bible was, um, well, no, it's not the first one, actually. I still thought of another one. Uh, but there is a prophecy of the flood. So Noah was told there was going to be a flood. Uh, he started warning people about it, started building his boat. Uh, people thought he was mad. They mocked him and they laughed him, at him. And they took no notice of him. But at the appointed time, the flood came, and the only people who were saved was Noah's family and his floating zoo. And these kinds of prophecies keep happening all through the Bible. That's what Oliver's doing on uh, Thursday evenings, isn't it? On, he's looking at a prophecy. Isaiah, 8th century BC, prophet. And I don't think there's a better prophecy than what is happening on Thursday evenings to tell us about the cross of Christ in the whole of the Bible than this one. 
And it was 800 years before it was written. But it explains what was happening on the cross when our Lord died uh, for us. Did you know there are 300 prophecies about Christ which he fulfilled when he came? And this morning, uh, we're waiting uh, for the prophecy to be fulfilled for the final day. The advice here from the Lord is to keep listening. Look at verse 3. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Habakkuk had to wait over 50 years for his piece of the two uh, to come to pass. In prophecies, there is normally uh, an immediate fulfillment, and then there is a long-term fulfillment. And so, see what the Lord is saying. What I'm telling you now, Habakkuk, is really going to happen. It's going to take time. Now, I imagine Habakkuk was something like the rest of us. We're not very good at waiting. Um, a lot of us are like that, aren't we? Uh, the other day I was talking to a friend in London, um, and they said, uh, I can't take living in this limbo much longer. I've just got to get on with life. A lot of people feel like that. We don't like waiting. But God says, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Whatever God promises in the Bible always happens. God's timing, of course, is not our timing. Uh, God works on a far bigger canvas than we do, and we can get impatient. I mean, um, I've been a Christian for 50 years, and my experience, my little experience in those years, is that God very often comes at the last minute. So he comes in the last carriage of the last train. But God always comes. That's what I've found. And God always does what he says he's going to do uh, in the Bible. And did you notice also that this prophecy is about the end of history? In verse 3, it speaks of the end and will not prove false and will not delay. The New Testament uses this verse uh, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 37. But the writer makes it personal uh, because he he makes it refer to our Lord. So he changes the it there of verse 3 to he. And this is what it says in Hebrews. In just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And uh, the writer of the Hebrews was writing to Christians who were losing their confidence in our Lord, beginning to think that his claims uh, may not be all they seem to be. But surely... We can have confidence in the Bible because if you want to check this out, look at the prophecies and see how prophecies are fulfilled hundreds of years sometimes uh, later. So if Jesus um, has promised to return, I believe we can trust him. I mean, of all the people who've ever lived, I would want to say that I would trust the Lord more than anyone else in history. And he promised that he was coming back. He made three very clear promises. He said he was coming personally. He said, just as you've seen me go, so I will return. He promised that he'll come suddenly. He likened himself to a thief coming in the middle of the night. You never know when a thief's coming. He said, I'm going to come when you least expect me. And the third thing he told us was that he was going to come majestically. He came as a poor man last time. When he returns, he's coming as a king, and he's going to sort out uh, the problems of our world. So as we wait, let's uh, keep listening. Um, there are some wonderful prophecies uh, in the Bible. Last Tuesday morning, I was a little home, home group I, I go to, uh, and we were looking at the prophecy of Daniel, and in it, there are quite a few, I hadn't realized there were so many 
prophecies about the return of the Lord Jesus. Now, we got quite excited, and this was 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're, we can be a bit grumpy, I suppose, like a group of men at 8 o'clock in the morning, a group of men at 8 o'clock in the morning can be. But just looking at the screen, people, we were, our faces were lit up as we looked at these prophecies. Uh, and so it's an encouragement as we look at our own problems and as we look at the problems of the world that actually uh, there are these prophecies and we believe that one day the Lord is going to return majestically, personally and suddenly. Let's have a look at the second piece of advice. Let's keep listening. But then the second piece of advice is in verse 4. Wait full of faith. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Now, this is one of the great sentences in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, it's repeated three times in the New Testament. So it, it, it's quoted in Romans, quoted in Galatians, uh, and quoted again in Hebrews. And there are only three words in the original Hebrew, and they come in this order. The righteous, by faith, shall live. For Habakkuk, the word righteous meant someone who was right with God. And we know that all the people in the Old Testament who were only ever right with God, it happened because of their faith. No one could keep the law. No one could keep the law. None of us can keep the law, can we? And that's true all through the Old Testament. There are, but there are people who, by faith, were made right with God. And in the New Testament, we're only right with God through faith alone, in Christ alone. And because this is so unlike any other religion, I think sometimes we forget this, but in every other religion, you have to work your way to be in a right relationship with God. In Christianity, it is a gift. It's pure generosity. We can never make ourselves right with God, no matter how hard we try. We will only be right with God because of his grace. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Calvin put it like this. Faith strips us of all arrogance and leads us naked and needy to God. That's what faith does to us. It's interesting. So we're not proud. We're not arrogant because we're right with God. Because faith, or we could put it this way, faith strips us of all arrogance and leads us naked and needy to the cross of Christ. So what happens when we come by faith and we put our trust in Christ hanging in our place, taking our sin, what happens? The New Testament tells us that we're clothed with righteousness. God clothes us in righteousness so that we're right uh, with him. That is Habakkuk. He was right with God through faith alone. And as he waited, he was told to go on living full of faith. I mean, faithful means full of faith. So if we're full of faith, we'll be faithful. And if we're faithful, we'll be full of faith. And Christianity is summed up in these three words. If we want to know what it means to be a Christian, this is it. The righteous, by faith, shall live. That's what makes us a Christian. We trust in Christ alone. But living by faith is a challenge in our world, isn't it? Uh, and it is here. Look at the background of this statement in verses 4 and 5. Habakkuk was going to be living in a world where the Babylonians were in charge. Uh, they were a ruthless war machine. And see how they're described in verse 4, puffed up. Verse 5, arrogant, never at rest, always greedy, never satisfied. Verse 5, heavy drinkers. That's how the Babylonian uh, empire collapsed, wasn't it? At that uh, banquet in Daniel 5. Uh, when 
in the Iran-Iraq war, and uh, the Medes turned up, and the, the whole banquet uh, knew about it because God had, had warned them. But isn't this the world we still live in? We still live in a Babylonian world. Here we are two and a half thousand years later, and it's still the same. Arrogance, insatiable, unjust. It's not easy to be pe people of faith, waiting, waiting for the Lord Jesus to return, waiting for him to come and sort out the problems, looking to him to come back and to help us and to be with us. So how are we waiting? Well, here's the tips. Wait and keep listening. Wait full of faith. I suppose we only really have two choices, don't we, as we look to the future. We can put our faith in reason. And if we put our faith in reason, we'll trust the philosophers and we'll trust the thinkers and we'll trust the experts, we'll tr trust the media, we'll trust the scientists and the politicians. Or our faith in Jesus of Nazareth, who we believe is the Lord of glory, the Lord of history, the Lord who's going to return. And if we believe that, then we will keep listening and we'll be full of faith and we'll trust him. Shall we pray? Father, all through the Bible, people were waiting, waiting for you. Abraham and Sarah, Moses, the people of Israel in the wilderness, the Old Testament waiting for the Messiah to come. And here we are, we've been waiting 2,000 years. Please forgive us for our lack of expectancy, our lack of faith our lack of trusting your prophecies and your promises. Thank you for this advice that you gave to Habakkuk as he had to wait. And we want to respond to your word. Please keep us listening to your revelation. Thank you for the hundreds of prophecies that have come true all through history. And help us to take time to read again the many promises that you make of our Lord's return so that we live by faith and with expectancy of the coming Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.